everyone and welcome to another entire topic video for CIE and this time it's topic 18 classification everything you possibly need to know and if you do want even more help understanding the theory knowing the key terms knowing the key marking points to help boost your exam grade then check out my a-level notes which i've got linked in the description below but for now let's get on to the content topic 18 we're going to be looking at classification biodiversity and conservation and we start with classification so there's different ways to define a species. You could have the biological species concept, which is a group of organisms that can reproduce to create fertile offspring. The morphological species concept, which is a group of organisms that may have physical features in common that are different to other species. Or the ecological species concept, which is a group of individuals of the same species living in the same area at the same time. And classification is the grouping of organisms according to their similarities. Individuals can be classified according to their physical and biochemical similarities. And they're grouped in hierarchies. And a hierarchy is when you have smaller groups placed within larger groups, but there are no overlaps between those groups. And in classification, each hierarchy is known as a taxon or taxa for plural. There are millions of species and the reason we use classification is so that we have a system to organise them. And the reason for this need to organise them is to help us in identifying species and that will help us to understand evolutionary relationships between species and to keep track of changes in population size. And it also enables scientists to share data on these different groups within different countries because the classification system is universally used. So here is the Linnaeus classification system, which is based on a hierarchy and we have these following taxa. Domain is the broadest way to group. Then we have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus and species. And you do need to remember the name of all of these and the order. So you might want to come up with a mnemonic to help you remember them. One common one that I've heard people use is, does King Philip come over for good soup? And that would help you to remember the order that those occur in. And then you just need to remember all of those different names of the taxa. And for the three domains, this, as I said, was the broadest way to classify or to group. And all life forms fit into either the archaea group, the bacteria group, or the UK group for these domains. And bacteria, this is the domain encompassing all prokaryotic organisms, except those that are categorized as archaea. Archaea, this is the domain comprising prokaryotic organisms, but they resemble bacteria sharing some of the characteristics with eukaryotes as well. And eukarya, that is the domain house in all eukaryotic organisms. So that includes the protoctus, fungi, plants and animals. Archaea and bacteria, both classified as prokaryotes, lacked, is because they lack membrane bound organelles and a nucleus. Despite that shared classification, they exhibit distinct differences in the membrane lipids, ribosomal RNA and the cell wall composition. And these variations contribute to the delineation between these two domains. So that's why they are split into those two different groups. Instead of it just being prokaryotes, it's actually bacteria and archaea to split that prokaryotic group up. The next taxon down from domain is kingdom. And we can split that into five different kingdoms. We have the prokaryote, the protoctiste, the fungi, plantae and animalia. So the prokaryote, that is our unicellular, no membrane bound organelles, small ribosomes. They have a ring of DNA with no associated proteins. There's no feeding system and it absorbs nutrients across its surface. And some of them can actually photosynthesize as well. The protoctists are also unicellular, but they have a nucleus and membrane bound organelles. And sometimes have chloroplasts, some have cilia, flagella for movement as well. Nutrients are absorbed either by creating it from photosynthesis or ingestion, or um, some of the organisms are parasites, so for example, malaria. Fungi can be unicellular or multicellular, so unicellular examples are yeast, um, and have a nucleus, membrane-bound organelles, no chloroplasts, cannot move, they have a body made of threads or hyphae, 
Nutrients are absorbed from dead and decay matter, so they are saprobionts, and they can store carbohydrate food as glycogen. Plants are multicellular, have a nucleus, membrane-bound organelles, have chloroplasts, and animals, multicellular, have a nucleus, no chloroplast, no cell wall, but that links back to what you would have learnt in the cell structure topic. Viruses are acellular, so they do not fall under any of these classification systems. They don't fall within the three domains because they're not considered living. They're classified by the type of nucleic acid they contain, so RNA or DNA, and whether it's single-stranded or double-stranded, but they don't get classified following these classification systems because they're not living things. So next then we move on to biodiversity. And here's a selection of the key terms you need to know linked to biodiversity, which would be great to turn into flashcards to help you to remember. So populations, this is groups of organisms of the same species living in the same habitat at the same time. Habitat is part of an ecosystem in which particular organisms live. Community is all the populations of different species in the same area at the same time. Ecosystem is a community and the non-living components of the environment. A niche is an organism's role in an ecosystem, but also its habitat. So that's often two marks to know it's the organism's role and its habitat. The carrying capacity is the maximum population size an ecosystem can support. And if there are more individuals than that carrying capacity level, then individuals will start to die because there'll be a lack of resources. Abiotic factors are the non-living conditions of an ecosystem. So things like rainfall, light intensity, pH of the soil or pH of water. And biotic factors is the impact of interactions between organisms. So predator-prey relationships and competition between organisms. So the way to measure biodiversity are these three options here. You can either measure the number and range of different ecosystems and habitats. And the reason you can use that is if there is a broader range of habitats and ecosystems, that will attract a greater range of animals and a greater range of plants would be present. So that would mean the greater biodiversity. You can measure the number of species and their relative abundance because that would indicate a greater biodiversity. And measuring genetic variation as well can be used. So essentially it's measuring habitats, number of species or genetic variation. And if we're going to be looking at the number or type of species in an area, we'd use sampling and it would be too time consuming to literally measure the biodiversity of an entire area, meaning counting every single individual of every species. So instead we would do sampling, which is when you measure only some of the population and we use this to represent the entire population. But for this to be an accurate representation, we have to make sure our sample is representative. So therefore it has to be a large sample. And if it's an area with a uniform distribution, we must randomly sample as well to avoid bias. So a bit about sampling then. We're gonna go through how you could sample the slow or non-moving organisms and also the moving or motile organisms. So we'd use a quadrat if it's slow or non-motile and mark release recapture if it's motile. Uniform distribution would use random sampling. Uneven, distribu uneven distribution would use systematic sampling, which is using a line transect. So we're going to go through random sampling, systematic sampling and mark release recapture, what each of those methods are, starting with the sampling using a quadrat. So random sampling, the method that we would use is lie two tape measures out at right angles to create a virtually gridded area. You then use a random number generator to generate two coordinates. And if your coordinates were, let's say, 9 and 11, you would walk up 9 metres and walk across 11. And where you meet is where you'd place your quadrat. And when you place your quadrat, you can then either collect the data in forms of density, percentage cover or frequency, which will come back to what that means. And because it has to be representative, we need to do a large sample. So to repeat that process at least 30 times and then calculate a mean for the area. Now, in contrast, we could do systematic sampling. And that is what we'd use if you have an unevenly distributed 
area. So if you were looking at a change over distance, so for example, on a sandy or rocky shore or across a path, instead of having two tape measures at right angles, you place one tape measure going through those different areas. So you would definitely sample what is present at each position in that uneven distributed area. And that one tape measure is known as a line transect. And a belt transect is when you'd place a quadrat on the line. So it's always going to be a belt transect that you would use. But you could either do a belt or interrupted belt. And interrupted is when you place the quadrat at intervals. Belt is when you place it at every single position along your tape measure. And we'd usually use interrupted because it's more time efficient and you're not actually gaining necessarily any extra information if you're placing it every single position. You're better off spacing it out at a distance. That means you will capture where all the changes are occurring. So our method description for this would be place the tape measure at a right angle to, in this case, it'd be the shoreline because that is where we are going to be positioning it so we can see all those changes. Place the quadrat every five metres or set intervals along that tape measure and then you'd collect the data. You'd then repeat by placing another 30 transects in parallel along that shoreline. So I said I'd come back to these three terms, density, percentage cover and local frequency. Density is when you would place your quadrat and you'd count every individual plant. So you can do that if you don't have too many to count and it's easy to identify one individual plant. And that would give you an accurate answer because you're literally counting the number that are in that quadrat. However, some plant species, it's hard to identify an individual plant, like moss, for example, or maybe there's just too many to count accurately, like grass. And in those instances, you'd either use percentage cover or local frequency. And for these ones, you would typically use a quadrat, which has got 100 squares within it. Now, I'm not going to literally draw 100 here. I'm just going to draw some grid lines so we get the concept. But there would be 100 squares that you would use. Local frequency is when you would just simply count how many of those 100 squares have the plant of interest in. And however many out of 100, that is your local frequency as a percentage. So if you had 5 out of 100, your local frequency would be 5%. Percentage cover is when you actually have to estimate what percentage of your quadrat is covered. So this time it's not just is it present in a square or not, it's whether you think that full square is covered to be able to count it as a full percentage. So we then go on to how you would sample moving organisms because we can't use a quadrat because they'd move away before you could count them. And we use the mark release recapture method. And here is the method for this. You would need to capture an initial sample of the population. You would then mark them. And we'll talk more about the ethics and the practicalities of that mark. And then you release them back after you've marked them, making a note of how many you caught and marked. And you need to make sure you release them and then leave them to randomly disperse for a long enough period of time that they do evenly disperse. You don't need to state a period of time you just need to say it's long enough that they randomly disperse. After that period of time, you then set your traps again, collect a second sample. And this is then when we can do our calculation because we would look at from that second sample, what is the total number that we captured and how many had the mark on them indicating they had been recaptured. So the calculation that we use for this is the Lincoln Index and that is provided for you in the exam. You just need to know how to use this Lincoln Index. So N is our population size estimate and M is the total number of individuals marked in the initial sample. C is the total number of individuals captured in the second sample. We multiply those together and then we divide that by the number of recaptured individuals from that initial sample, which means the number that have the mark in them in that second capture. And this will then give us our population estimate. So if we think about an example of this, we've got 20 butterflies were initially caught and marked. 
We then had a second sample captured in which 22 were caught, nine of which had the markings. So we would do 20, which was our initial sample, which is M, times 22, which is the number captured in the second sample, which is C, divided by nine, which is R, the number recaptured, and that comes to 48.89. Because we're estimating the number of individuals, we need to round to a whole number. So 49 butterflies would be our estimation of the population size. So going back to the concept of how we mark them, it has to be a mark that is all weather resistant and it's not going to come off because otherwise you're going to lose the mark and you won't know that you've initially caught them. But you need to make sure that the way you capture them and mark them isn't going to cause any permanent damage or harm to the organism. So if you're going to use a paint, it has to be a non-toxic paint. You need to make sure however you tag them isn't going to increase their chances of being spotted or caught and eaten by a predator. And it mustn't interfere with their courtship ritual or chances of reproduction. Final thing linked to this is your estimate may not be accurate and that is because of the assumptions linked to the formula. We are estimating a population size between our first sample and then when we recapture and do a second sample but we're assuming that the population size is constant in that time. So that might mean we're assuming that there were no births, no deaths and no migration. And the reality is that's probably very unlikely. There would be some change in the population size. The other reason it might be inaccurate is we said that when we release the individuals after being marked, we leave them for long enough to distribute evenly in their habitats. But the reality is animals don't evenly distribute across their habitats. They're more likely all to huddle together in favourable location, so near a water source, near a food source, near shelter. And then in that way, you aren't necessarily going to be getting an accurate representation of all the animals present, because wherever your traps are, you might capture lots of them because that's where they happen to huddle, or none of them because the traps in a place they don't tend to um, huddle. Whenever collecting data like this and analysing data, we should always use a statistic to be able to see if we have a significant difference or correlation. And when analysing a relationship between two continuous variables, so for example, how a particular abiotic or biotic factor affects the distribution or abundance of a species, like you might be investigating when you're sampling, that would be the pattern of a correlation. And we would need to know whether we have a significant correlation. So you might be looking at, is there a correlation between the light intensity and the abundance of a particular species? And that is when we'd use the correlation coefficient, Spearman's rank or Pearson's linear. Those are two statistics that you would have the formula provided for in an exam to be able to see if your um, patterns were or correlation was significant. Now, another way to measure diversity is using the index of diversity. And this combines both the number of different species and the population size of each within a community. And it uses this formula here, where D is the diversity. Capital N is the total number of organisms of all species. And lowercase n is the total number of organisms of one particular species. And this formula would be provided for you in the exam. You just need to know how to use the Simpson's index of diversity. And the key thing is knowing that you have to do the sum of lowercase n divided by capital N squared, meaning you have to work this out for every species present, and then you add that together for all of the species present. Finally, then we go on to conservation. An extinction is when all individuals of a species have died out, and this could be the result of climate change, competition between species and one species being outcompeted, hunting or overhunting by humans, degradation or loss of habitat as well. And all of those, extinction or even if you haven't got extinction, would result in a decreased biodiversity. So climate change is the changing of the environmental conditions and habitats that results in them being uninhabitable for species and therefore they're not able to survive there. It's also causing polar ice caps to melt, 
and flooding, which results in the destruction of habitats, which can also lead to extinction. Habitats could also be destroyed through human actions, such as deforestation, either for the timber or for having land for agriculture or for building. Overhunting is another human impact that can cause extinction, which has been seen historically when humans have hunted flightless birds to extinction, like dodos. Interspecific competition, this is when two different species are competing for the same limited resource. One species will outcompete the other, which can result in the extinction of the species that is unable to access the resource for survival. So humans can put actions in place to try and reduce this extinction and therefore maintain biodiversity. And that's what conservation is. And it's really important that we do conserve species and biodiversity for various reasons. Number one is an ethical reason. All organisms have the right to live and conservation helps to ensure humans are not preventing this. Conservation also helps ensure that future generations are able to experience natural ecosystems. There's a social side as well. People enjoy the outdoors and it provides many physical and mental benefits to people having a rich biodiversity. And the last one is the economic advantage. We get many medicines, food, clothes, timber, and also tourism from sources in the natural ecosystem. And that would all be lost if we did not conserve our biodiversity. So the roles of different ways then to try and conserve our biodiversity, we're gonna look at the role of the zoo first, and that can be conservation breeding. Zoos play a vital role in breeding and maintaining populations of endangered species by breeding them in captivity acting as genetic reservoirs and that prevents extinction. Zoos also provide education and awareness to people. So they educate the public about endangered species and conservation efforts, as well as other outreach activities. They also conduct research on endangered species behavior and reproduction to try and have better conservation strategies, both in captivity and the wild. There's also species reintroduction. So some zoos participate in species reintroduction programs where captively bred individuals are then later released into the natural habitats to bolster the wild populations. We also have botanical gardens and this helps with plant conservation. So botanic gardens preserve endangered plant species through ex situ conservation, maintaining living collections of plants for research, education and species recovery efforts. Seed banks is when botanical gardens house seed banks, which is where seeds of endangered plant species are stored under controlled conditions for long-term preservation and future restoration projects. And then again as well, research and education is going to help educate the public about the importance of plant conservation and biodiversity. Next time we can have a look at the role of national parks and marine parks, which are conserved areas. So by having these conserved areas, we have habitat protection. National parks and marine parks provide protected areas for endangered species, safeguarding their habitats from human activities such as destruction, pollution and over-exploitation. We also get species conservation. These areas support populations of endangered species, allowing them to thrive and recover without human interference, whilst also preserving ecosystem integrity. Ecotourism and recreation, this is where we've got conserved areas that contribute to local economies through ecotourism and recreational activities, raising funds for conservation efforts and fostering public support for those protected areas. You can also do conservation through frozen zoos, which is where we have cryogenic preservation facilities. And this helps with genetic conservation. So frozen zoos is where you store genetic materials such as sperm cells or egg cells or embryos or tissue samples from endangered species in cryogenic facilities. And that preser preserves their genetic diversity for future conservation initiatives. You also have genetic research and these facilities support research on reproductive biology, genetics and genomics of endangered species, which helps to inform breeding programs and population management strategies. And then we've got the emergency response. So cryogenic preservation facilities serve as an emergency backup in case of catastrophic events, disease outbreaks, or other threats to species survival, allowing for rapid response to recovery efforts.
Now, seed banks, we've actually talked about a little bit already. So this is just a brief overview going through it in a bit more detail. So you can pause, read through this and add to your notes uh, because it's essentially what we've just gone through with the concept of seed banks. Now, invasive species, these are non-native organisms that have been introduced to an ecosystem and have the potential to cause harm to the environment, economy and even human health. And a key example of that is the cane toad, which is an invasive species in Australia. It was native to Hawaii, but when it was brought to Australia, it outcompeted many other amphibian species. And the toxin that they produced through their skin also killed predators such as snakes that ate them. These species, which are invasive species, often exhibit rapid population growth and spread out competing the native species for resources and they disrupt the natural ecosystem. And due to their ability to thrive in the environment and the fact that they lack natural predators means that these invasive species can become dominant and alter the entire structure of the ecosystem. So it's really important that for conservation, we control invasive species to try and prevent the biodiversity loss that they might cause, the ecosystem damage and the economic damage as well. Next up, we've got our IUCN and CITSs or sites in conservation. So what these are then is um, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. This serves as a global authority on the status of the natural world and the measures required to safeguard it. So among its key functions, the IUCN conducts assessments of the conservation status of numerous animals. It uses classification systems and it evaluates risks of species extinction by monitoring their population. We also have the information that they provide is made accessible online through the red list of threatened species. Species are assigned to categories based on their conservation status as an indication of how at risk they are of going extinct. Then we've got the Convention of International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, which was established in 1973. And that was initially signed by 145 countries to regulate the trade in endangered species or their products, such as furs, skin or ivory. So since those sites started, more countries have joined this international agreement and sites categorise species into three groups based on the evidence presented regarding their conservation status. Expert committees review and update these lists, although concerns have been raised about the effectiveness of this. In some cases, listing a species actually has a negative impact because if something is considered to be even more rare and it's risk of going extinct, that increases its value on the black market, leading to an increase in illegal hunting and trade of those organisms and therefore threatening their survival even further. So despite these challenges, science plays a crucial role in regulating the international trade in endangered species and raising awareness about the importance of conservation efforts. So that takes us to the end of this topic. Hopefully you found it helpful. If you did, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of my latest videos.